Hey, good morning. I hope you're having a great day. Today is the last day of the book of Revelation, chapter 22, morning devotion. Um, it has been a very, very fun study. I hope that you've enjoyed it as much as I have um, teaching it. Um, there's been so much good information here, but I, I want to just recap very quickly the entire point in a single word, Jesus, or as John wrote in, John, in Revelation 1 and 1, the revelation of Jesus Christ. Everything is pointing to Jesus. Everything is to reveal Jesus. The light of heaven is Jesus. Uh, the city of heaven is about Jesus. Jesus is the temple. Jesus is the judge. Jesus is the merciful one. Everything is about him. Don't, anytime you hear anyone talk about the book of Revelation, they start saying that it's about the uh, four horsemen, or it's about the vials, or it's about whatever. It, it's about Jesus. Everything is to point people to Jesus, and we're going to show how it kind of culminates that and why he gave us this revelation. Chapter 22 kind of tells us why he gave us this revelation. And so here we go. Revelation chapter 22, beginning at verse number one. It says, and he showed me a pure river of water of life. So this is but the only river that's, can, that, that's mentioned here. Clear as crystal proceeding out of the throne of God and of the Lamb. So here begins the description of the triumph and joy of God's people in God's eternal kingdom. Now, many theological and revelation experts see Revelation 22 as the restoration of all that was lost in the Garden of Eden. You'll find parallels. You'll find the this river. You'll find the tree of life. You'll find many parallels that from Genesis 1 through 3 in Revelation 22. And this is a restoration of all that was lost there. Um, so this as a provision for believers and in keeping with the complete holiness and the purity of this heavenly city, John sees in verse one, uh, this pure river of water of life coming out of the throne. And then in verse two, it talks about the tree of life. In the midst of the street of it, and so apparently this is like a stream in the midst of the street of it. And on either side of the river, there was a tree of life. Tree of life is, was also in Genesis 1 or, or the book of Genesis. And there was the tree of life, which bare 12 manner of fruits and yielded her fruit every month. And the leaves of the nation were for the healing of the nation. Now, verse 2, because it is somewhat obscure presentation has caused some difficulty uh, for the experts that I've studied and, and read. Um, there's a lot of differing views here. The picture is that the river flows through the middle of the city and the tree is large enough to span the river so that the river is in the midst of the street and the tree is on both sides of the river. It would appear that the river is not a broad body of water, but a clear stream sufficiently narrow to allow for this arrangement. The tree of life seems to have been referenced to the similar tree in the Garden of Eden, Genesis 3. If Adam and Eve would have eaten of the tree of life, physical death would have apparently have been impossible. The tree in the New Jerusalem seemed to have a very similar quality and intent, although it's difficult um, to distinguish between the literal and the symbolic, the tree is said to bear fruit that apparently can be eaten and also to provide leaves for the healings of the nations. In other words, the leaves of the tree promote the enjoyment of life in the new Jerusalem and is not um, for the correcting of illnesses as we view healing is more of an enjoyment. Uh, this is this is confirmed by the fact that there are no more there's no more curse as indicated in verse three, which highlights the throne of God because it says, and there shall be no more curse, but the throne of God and of the lamb shall be in it and the servants shall serve or worship him. 
in the new heaven and the new earth, there will be no curse at all. There will be no possibility for need or such divine punishment, no sickness. There will be no curse of sin. There will be, there will be a throne with God sitting on it, the lamb who was slain from the foundation of the earth. Verse four says, and they shall see his face and his name shall be in their foreheads and there shall be no night there and there they need no candle, neither light nor of the sun for the Lord God giveth them light and they shall reign forever and ever. This is highlighting a blessed fellowship. God's name on their forehead indicates that they belong to him. And the fact that they see his face demonstrates beyond question that these are glorified saints. Once again, in verse 5, John repeats the fact that there will be no need for night. There'll be no need for light because God will be there and God is the light. God, Jesus, is the, is the light of the world and the light of this city, and the light of heaven. Verse 6, I feel like I could preach this here. The certainty of the blessed hope. Verse 6 and 7 says, And he said unto them, me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophets sent his angel to show unto his servants the things which, which must shortly be done. Behold, I come quickly. Blessed is he that keepeth the sayings of the prophecy of this book. Here, John seems to referring to Christ coming for his church rather than the second coming to, his, to earth, though both are in a much larger context. And if you don't mind me adding one of my opinions on this is whenever he says, and he said to me, these sayings are faithful and true. And the Lord God of the holy prophet sent his angels to show unto his servants the things which must shortly be done not only be done in the heavens and in the earth and in the revelation but also if you go back to revelation 3 and and so on whenever he wrote the church letters to the churches he's saying hey there's some things that each church needs to clean up and fix they need to be done quickly because i am coming quickly i come quickly blessed is he that keepeth these sayings of the prophecy in this book and and then whenever John hears these, he said, I saw these things and heard them. And when I heard them and seen, I fell down to worship before the feet of the angel, which showed me these things. He was so overwhelmed. John was so overwhelmed. He began to worship. Then saith he unto me, see thou do it not for I am thy fellow servant and of thy brethren and prophets and of them, which keep the sayings of this book, worship God. John is once again overwhelmed by the revelation given to him. His response is natural, but he is rebuked by the angel who informs him, as he did previously, that he is John's fellow servant. We're in this together. And, you know, I also found it interesting, as it was in chapter 19, that the one speaking, though an angel, is declared to be a fellow servant and related to human servants of the Lord. And so he said, hey, I'm a... I'm a fellow servant with you. This is an angel. I'm a fellow servant and thy brethren of the prophets and of them that keep the sayings of this book. And the angel's command is direct and very to the point. Worship God. Don't worship angels. Don't worship prophets. Don't worship revelation. Don't worship um, the revelation itself. Don't worship all of the things. Don't get enamored with all of those other things. I know that they're glorious but you can, you can get overwhelmed with it. And like John, whenever he saw great mystery Babylon, he wondered with great admiration. Don't wonder with great admiration at these things. Just worship God. That is the point. And so, he, so the whole thing is surrounded around worship. And he said to me, seal not the sayings of the prophecy of this book, for the time is at hand. He's saying, don't hide this. Don't hide what you've seen. Don't hide what you've heard. You need to tell it. And he, and then he says, he that is unjust, let him be unjust still. He that's filthy, let him be filthy still. He that's righteous, let him be righteous still. He that's holy, let him be holy still. What does this mean? It means I want you to come. He gave a command to proclaim the prophecy. And it's laid out here. You lay it out before people. And if people believe it, they believe it. If people still want to be unjust after they hear it, 
so be it, let them. If they still wanna be filthy after they hear the prophecy, let them. If people wanna be righteous after they hear it, let them. If they wanna be holy, let them. It said, because here it is, you lay it out. If they accept it, good. If they don't accept it, it's really on them. Um, verse 11 contains this strange command, but here's the, but the truth of the matter is, is that present choices will become their per permanent character. Present choices will become permanent in character. And, and, you know, you, you're going to deal with people who some believe this and some don't. And if they believe it, great. If they don't, great. I've, I've always believed and I have the mindset that we deal with adults and adults make adult decisions and adult decisions have adult consequences. And you lay out the facts, you lay out the, what they have, you hope for the best. But at the end of the day, if someone's unjust, let them be unjust. And you, tr you pray that they change. You pray that people's hearts turn toward God. You pray that they believe, but if they don't, they don't. And that is the beauty. And that was the command that he's given. There's some that's not going to believe your prophecy, John. And if they're unjust, let them be unjust still. I said, but you still have to proclaim it. And behold, Jesus begins to speak. And behold, I come quickly and my reward is with me uh, to give every man according as his work shall be. There's a blessed hope and assurance and reward. This is the second announcement alerting um, John concerning the Lord's coming. And I'm going to give my reward as, as, as his work shall be. I'm going to look at everyone, see what they've done. And um, I'm going to reward them accordingly, both good and evil. And then verse 17 is the invitation of the spirit and the bride. And the spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come, and whosoever will, let him take of the water of life freely. There's an invitation here. Why don't you go ahead and and just come? The Holy Spirit and the and the church, Christ's bride, is now issuing a wonderful invitation to everyone and say, you know what? Why don't you come? The Spirit's drawing you, the church is drawing you come let let's let anyone that wants to hear come let anyone who's spiritually thirsty come and whoever will come let him drink let him take of the water freely what a beautiful invitation that he's given us uh, the church has a purpose and it's to tell people to come the spirit has a person is, is to draw us close to god and this is the final testimony of Christ. For I testify unto every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book. If any man shall add to these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in the book. And if any man shall take away from the words of this book of the prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and out of the things which are written in this book. So in other words, these people were in the, the book of life. They begin to add things to it. They begin to add salvation things to it. They begin to, what they ended up doing was Jesus plus this, Jesus plus that, Jesus plus, Jesus plus. And he's like, I don't want that. It's me and me alone. When, since when is Jesus not enough? He which testifieth of these things saith, surely I come quickly, amen. Even so, come, Lord Jesus. Just in case you're curious about who's coming, it is the Lord Jesus. And then he gives the benediction. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all. Amen. The grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the final book of the scriptures, which began with the revelation of Jesus Christ, ends with a prayer that his grace will be upon you, and his grace would be in your life. Probably no book of the Bible presents a more stark contrast between righteousness and evil than this, between mercy and judgment than this. In no other book are these issued. But this is one of the most beautiful pictures, one of the most beautiful things about Scripture. No other book are issues made more specific. <laughs> With, when, with John, I believe that we can all pray, even so, come quickly, 
Lord Jesus. Jesus, we want you to come. Jesus, we want your kingdom to come because we want you to rule and reign. And we're so honored that we can even know you, Jesus, and that you would even be with us, that you would give your life a ransom for us. Lord, I ask that you show us exactly what it takes to have our names written in the book of life. God, we repent to you, Jesus, and we want to be baptized in your name, Jesus, and we want to receive your spirit, Jesus. We want to have the mark of you upon us. Let these things be done this day in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless all of you. Um, I'm so honored that you went through this Book of Revelation study. I hope that you enjoyed it. If you have any questions or if you um, have anything, comments, or you're curious about the Book of Life or anything in the Book of Revelation, please reach out. We'd be happy to, uh, to talk about it with you. This is not something that we are looking to debate. I know that the Book of Revelation brings much debate. We're not looking to debate the contents of, of it or anything like that. We're just simply looking to lay it out. Here it is. Here's what the revelation of Jesus Christ is. And we hope that um, it reveals Jesus to you because that's what we want more than anything. We simply want Jesus to be revealed in your life. God bless you. Have a wonderful day. And um, we will you know what? Tune in tomorrow and we will start a new book of the Bible. God bless you and uh, I'll see you tomorrow.